Hey everybody, welcome to the Atheist Experience. We are live. It is Sunday, January 22nd, 2017. I'm Matt Delaney. Joining me this week, Theresa Harris. Howdy. How are you doing? Good. Good. How are you? I'm, I'm not too bad. I've had a, a really good week. It's been uh, really busy. Okay. Uh, I was very fortunate. My my good friend and favorite comedian, Keith Lowell Jensen, came to town. We went down to UT San Antonio and did a little stuff together and... Then he worked at the Velveeta Room for two nights, and we went to all those shows, and it was great, uh, and had a good time, and yeah, book him. Just have him come out and tell godless jokes to you, I mean, if that's what you want to do. But uh, th there's been a number of other things going on. Yesterday, there was the Women's March. Yes, huge. Holy moly. Huge. It huge. was huge. It was huge. <laughs> uh, we, we went uh, here in Austin kind of expecting... You know, they had said like three to 5,000 or something like that. And I got there, and I'm, I'm standing. We finally got parked, and we walked up. I think we got about 20 minutes before 12 when it was supposed to start. And me and Beth and Keith were, were all standing there, and I'm looking around, and I'm realizing we can't get into the Capitol grounds more than about 10 feet, which means it's packed, and that most of Congress is packed. And on both side streets, I could see people all the way up to the hills. And I... I'm I'm pretty good at <laughs> estimating a lot of the time, you know, and I remember, you know, like, I know the size of different theaters. Like, this is a 1,400-seat theater, so I know sure. what 1,400 people look like. There's, you know, 25 or whatever on the other side of the glass. And I looked around, and I was like, this is way more than five. I, it wouldn't surprise me to find out that there were maybe, like, 20,000 people here. And as the day got went on, or as, the longer we were out there, the bigger the num my estimate grew. Even though I didn't see any more people, it was clear People were marching by, and we were unable to move and join the march for more than an hour until our section managed to get in. And so my estimates kept climbing. I heard there were almost 40,000 people here in Austin, and I know there's a lot of cities that had uh, far greater crowds than that. Yeah, I turned it on. Um, I had run some errands, and I came home and turned it on to see the coverage, and the first city that they were showing when I flipped it on was New York, mm -hmm. and it was absolutely mind-blowing like how huge it was. And then when they went to Boston, it was funny because at first they were showing this open field and there were um, a good number of people packed in, but then there were some people just kind of milling around and I thought, well, you know, that doesn't look as packed as New York or, you know, it didn't mm -hmm. look. And they said, this is the overflow that's like waiting to join the march. They're standing around because there's we can't squeeze them onto the route. And that was when I was like, okay, that makes a huge difference in what I'm looking at. I think that was the thing I heard most yesterday was how everybody kind of undersold and, and overperformed uh, with, I don't know, weren't there estimates of some cities at almost like a quarter of a million, something like that? The shot from the up, of, like from the, the aerial view of New York, I think, was the most mind-blowing thing I saw. That was the one where I just looked at the sheer numbers of people on that New York City grid, and I was, I just couldn't, I mean, I've been to New York a few times, and I could not imagine that. I, you know, I'm so glad that nothing, you know, nothing bad <laughs> happened or, you know, because it would have just been, it, they were packed in like sardines. And I'm so glad I that agree. everything was so uh, peaceful and everybody seemed to be, um, you know what I mean? There, there were, were, I don't know how, if there were reports of violence or anything, but I didn't hear anything like that. I and hadn't heard any reports, but Based I, I on the numbers of some... people, it'd be hard to have like nothing sure. occur. But based on those numbers of people, the fact that it went as well and as smoothly as it did, I think, speaks volumes. Oh, I was, there was a, a point in time where I was in a mood, and of course people standing around are, are getting irritated because everybody really wanted to march, but you've got to wait for the first 20,000 people right. to get out of the way, and nobody expected it. <laughs> it it's very difficult to, to organize, or even once those people get there and you realize this is way bigger than anything we planned for, you can't give instructions to 20,000 people. And, and by the way, there were so many people, there was no cell service. I, I'm presuming that cell service in the area was everybody was pinging every tower and so that you just couldn't actually, you know, use any data. Uh, there were people who commented, well, maybe the government shut off your cell service. And I'm like, I don't think they're going to stop this news from getting out. Uh, <laughs> estimates, though, I, I heard from, from demonstrations around the world were close to 3 million. 
which I found was ironically the difference in the popular vote during the election. So it's like everybody, may, potentially, you can make yeah. the joke that everybody who uh, didn't get their way in the vote or, or the overage was, was out there protesting. I think they're still doing estimates. I don't know if um, actual figures have come in yet, but I know they're still tallying some things. Yeah, I, I was reluctant to even yeah. try to put a number on it, but those are the numbers I heard. Uh, you know, they're as true as any number you're going to hear from anybody else. Because, you know, who cares about its truthiness? It's alternative facts. Yeah, alternative facts. Uh, the couple announcements to get out of the way first. Uh, the Atheist Community of Austin, on behalf of this show, not just about the community at large, but the Atheist Experience TV show, is launching a public opinion survey. Uh, you can go to atheist-community.org, and along the top of there, there'll be a link that just says survey. That goes live today. Uh, we'd like you to provide feedback about the group and the shows. Um, and to thank you for your valuable time, they'll be giving away ACA gear like T-shirts and mugs. And the survey will run for one week. So if you're watching this on a rebroadcast two years from now, you, <laughs> you missed it. Yeah. Uh, but we'll try to make the rest of the show, you know, not suck. Yeah, but can't ask you enough to, to take that survey and, and to help us out with that. Were there um, any restrictions on the survey as far as devices or things like that or... Was that? Uh, I had received a report that it wasn't working on mobile devices, but I checked it on mine and it was working as okay. long as you go directly to the survey link and not try to go through the page. There may be some problems there. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're looking okay. forward to hearing back from everybody on anything, you know? What do you like? What do you don't like? Yes, please. I mean, it's, it, this is about trying to inform us. We don't have a lot of information on show demographics. So it's, it's really going to be useful for us to have an idea of who the viewers are and what they want and what they like and what they don't like. Get some pancake makeup on Matt's head so the <laughs> lights don't blind me while I'm watching the show, whatever. Okay. But uh, And you had an announcement about yeah, yeah. the Yeah, yeah, we got a late announcement that, that rolled in right before the show. Um, apparently we have a, ACA's uh, got part of the Texas Ramp Project, mm -hmm. like um, Phil helps us out with that and is very active in it and works in both San Antonio and Austin. And he says that the next ramp is going to be happening this Saturday on the 28th, beginning around 8 a.m. And you can get more details like the location or where to sign up to help out um, at the Facebook group or the meetup um, and look under events. Info is also available on the website event calendar. So be sure and, and go and look for that. And the other announcement from the ACA is that we'll be celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Atheist Community of Austin. Uh, on February 10th, there'll be a uh, party here at the Free Thought Library at 7 p.m. Uh, with pizza and cake, which I'm told is not a lie. Uh, how long can we keep doing that joke? I mean, haven't we all learned about the cake by now? Uh, but we'll also be holding a members meeting uh, to let everyone know what's going on and to hear feedback as well. So it's February 10th, 7 p.m. right here, uh, 1507 West Caney Lane. The address and all the information is on the calendar and the website. Free Thought Library. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, and I wasn't here on the show last week. Um, and so last Sunday, my wife had made 58 knitted hats. Okay. And we went up to uh, underneath the underneath I thirty five there at Seventh gotcha. Street um, on Sunday mornings. There's a number of groups, a lot of them religious, who do what they can to help out those in need. Our Austin has a, a, a significant homeless population, and so this group, Humanism at Work, we went out with them. Beth gave away uh, all all of the hats. All fifty eight of the hats were taken, even though it's kind of warm right now, but it might it might cool down again. But they're not only in need of volunteers, but supplies and everything from, you know, toothpaste, sanitary napkins, toilet paper, anything to help keep you clean, keep you fed, keep you entertained and engaged. Decks of cards, books, lots of clothes. Uh, there was a ton of stuff that was given away. And when I posted it, uh, it seems, and I'm not going to go like opening wounds, uh, that this group, Humanism at Work, I used to work alongside or with or be part of atheists helping the homeless and whatever there was a rift and somebody's like oh well that group over there you know you're working with the wrong group bullshit i'm happy to go help people with atheists helping the homeless with humanism at work and with the local baptist church as long as i'm actually doing good now i would prefer that there be more secularists out there uh it's one of the areas where i think it's uh, I, I understand the difficulty, sometimes personality clash, sometimes people want to go in different directions. Cool, let's have as many groups helping people as we can, yeah. and I'll go out whenever I'm in town to to help out whoever I can. So I know that 
Atheist Help Me Homeless, Homeless is going to be having a number of events coming up, and you can check that out as well. And if you have people in need in your area and you don't have an organization like this, you can reach out to those organizations that have been founded here and elsewhere, whether it's Atheist Help Me Homeless, Humanism at Work, whatever, and get advice from them on how you can start a group in your local area, and we can just keep doing more good. But Also, uh, last time I was on the show, there was a gentleman, from uh, Steve from Phoenix, who called in. Uh, who was talking about truth and whether or not there could be truth without a God. And, you know, we kind of made this bet because it was getting frustrating. It was, if everybody who knows that there's a phone on this table dies, is, is, is it still true that there's a phone on this table? And my answer was yes, and his answer was no. And uh, he ended up, I, I basically said that he was going to argue that there could be no truth without God. And he's like, oh, no, I'm not. And then he did. Uh, so he wrote a letter. And uh, we're, we're grateful to Steve, and he paid up his dollar that he owes us, so I'll be donating that directly to the Atheist Community of Austin. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to turn this into a gambling show, but if anybody else would like to, you know, place bets, uh, if I lose, I'll take it out of my own pocket, and if we win, we'll be donating it to the Atheist Community of Austin and doing what we can to help the organization and to help people in need. So, did you have any other topic -y things that we needed to hit? Not really. Then we're going to go to calls. Uh, this is a call-in show out of Austin, Texas. I don't know if that even appears down there. It's just like, it's like atheist experience, blah, blah, blah. We take live calls. We talk about what you believe, why you believe it. The why part is the important thing. We, tend to, we have six lines. We tend to favor theist callers so that we can have conversations about what I think is one of the biggest elephants in the room, and that is religious belief and the privileged position that religions hold in our culture in the, here in the United States and around the world. It's more problematic in some areas than others. Before you take a call, mm -hmm. I did watch the prayer service, mm -hmm. um, and I was happy to see that atheists were included. They had a song that was sung about if there's people that don't believe in God, God will touch their heart. And I was like, oh, look at that. Oh. I was included. The, God's going to eventually get to me, I guess. And uh, Is he going to get consent first or is he just going to do it? Because I don't want anybody, God or otherwise, well, touching my heart. Under administration, I don't know if you need consent anymore. Right. But it's, uh, yeah, so that was interesting because I was like, I wonder if atheists will be included. Then they, they started out the heart. song with, you know, if uh, some people believe... Something about, like, um, don't believe that you know, this is the word of God or something like that, and God will, and I was like, wow, they, there I am. God will grab them by the heart <laughs> is what it is there. All right, so, uh, yeah, it's a live, live call-in program. We're going to go ahead and get to callers. Uh, as a reminder, after the show's over, some of the people involved in the show get together and go to dinner. Uh, right now, I think we're still going to Star of India. There's the address, 2900 West Anderson Lane. We do this from 4.30 Central till about 6 p.m. Central, give or take, when we kind of end the show and then get over there shortly afterwards. But first caller out of uh, Midland, Texas, we've got Eddie. Thanks for waiting. Hey, how are you doing, Matt? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Um, I'm, I waited till this weekend to call in because uh, you were the moderator for the uh, Robert Price and Bart Ehrman debate. Yeah. And, and I heard some of your... your when you were on a group phone call with, uh, I believe it's Richard Carrier and there are a couple other people, and you guys were discussing uh, the at the after the debate. Right. Yeah. So for those who aren't aware, uh, mythicists, mythicists Milwaukee put on a debate between Bob Price and, and Bart Ehrman about whether or not Jesus existed as a historical figure. I was the moderator, and after the debate was over, I did a number of discussions, including the one uh, that Eddie heard with um, Richard Carrier. Talking, giving our thoughts about the debate, about what went right, what went wrong, and and in my views in general. So, what what question or comment did you have about that? Well, ba basically, my my comment is basically, I think if you're going to take the the Jesus mythicist position, it's almost as tenable as taking a flat Earth position. And well, I no, actually, because that, we ha we have concrete evidence that the Earth isn't flat. Wouldn't you say? Right, and we, we do have we have concrete, concrete evidence. Do we have concrete evidence that Jesus existed that is comparable to that for which we have that the Earth is is not flat? Well, it it depends. We have the letters of Paul where he says Paul hey, never I met Jesus, did he? Did Paul ever meet Jesus, the living Jesus? Well, I, I if I recall correctly, didn't he say he met his brother? Okay, so how do you meet the brother of a mythical guy? So, so you've got a bunch of stories. Do you have anything <laughs> other than story, testimonials? I mean, if, if, okay, all we had, a, if all we had to determine that the Earth wasn't flat was a handful of people who said that the Earth wasn't flat, 
um, then you'd, you'd be able to compare the two. See, this is where I think you're being disingenuous, and, and here's why. If you took any other historical circumstance where someone wrote a letter and I said, oh, hey, I went and visited Matt Dillahunty's brother, mm-hmm. nobody would ever say, it's, it's almost like because it's Jesus, well, we're going to say it's a myth. Yes. If I had said, hey, I Dude. went and visited Matt Dillahunty's letter, and you, or brother, I went and visited Matt Dillahunty's brother, and you had my letter, yeah. nobody would think you were a myth. Right. But does that mean I have a brother? No, I'm... Is that enough to reasonably conclude that I have a brother just because somebody said they met my brother? In a letter, if you, in a letter, I, w- I would, yeah, I, I would presume... That the preponderance of the evidence is in favor of you having a brother if it's written down, yeah. Yeah, so here's what happens as far as historical methods. If somebody is presented as a real living, breathing figure, then because we can't prove they're not, we don't have time machines, we generally just assume they do. But it's not like we're saying we're absolutely convinced that that's the case. There's a number of urban legends and myths where at different times people were convinced these were actual historical figures, and then we come to find out that perhaps they weren't. Paul, you know, Paul Bunyan, um, uh, King Arthur, etc. So, well, yeah, so the issue okay. here, let's say that you become convinced that I'm real because somebody told you, or that I actually existed because some, you read a note that's where somebody said they met my brother. Okay? Cool. What else do you know about me? Well, I also know, if we, if we use that same Jesus scenario... I also know from Paul's letters that he went and hung out with three of Jesus' closest disciples. I understand that, but what do you know about Jesus from Paul? I know he existed. Well, no, I don't think you know he existed. It's just that you're convinced that that's a reasonable explanation that he existed. And I'm not saying you're wrong. I I specifically have not taken up the mythicist position. Well, I'd be curious to hear the verse that we're talking about. I mean, I, I think, well, um, yeah, I think that would I, it, be kind of... I think it's, it's in Galatians. In Galatians, Paul says he went up to Jerusalem, and that's where he met with James, the brother of the Lord. Sure. Right, but I, I guess I want to look at... I'm going to go ahead and look it up. Y'all can continue the discussion. Well, it was but, actually part of the debate, this James, the, the brother of the Lord, and it's something that Carrier and I talked about, about whether it means yeah, an there was actual a question, biological brother. Right, there's a question because the, the term brother was used between Christians. I mean... But it, that's... That if you read the text and you read the text in Greek, which I'm learning Greek, it's it, the way you would read it is just like Bart Ehrman said. There's really only one way to read that is it was actually Richard Carrier disputed that. So, but I'm not an expert either. L- let me get to the to the to the point here. E- let's assume for a second that Jesus actually existed. I have no problem with that. That there was somebody named Jesus that these people were talking about. Were they all talking about the same person? What facts from this person's life can we be confident about? Well, okay, I, I think I think we can fairly say there's a couple things. I think we I think we can say that there was at least a guy named Jesus. I think we can say that he was executed under Pontius Pilate. I think there's enough historical evidence that supports both of that. And I, I guess my main gripe is is. If you look at what the mythicists have to go through and and the way they have to dance around to get to their position, I mean, they have to basically, and this is why the debate didn't work. You can't have someone on on stage like Robert Price saying, you know, we have have the seven undisputed Pauline epistles, right? Scholars just don't dispute them now. But then you have him coming out and saying that, well, I dispute them. Yes, he does. Okay, and so well, this is flat earth. So Eddie, there's Eddie, flat earth. Eddie, any individual? Yeah. No, it's not like flat earth. I any, thought Price's it, book was really well received. I mean, I could be wrong. Price holds a number of incredibly unorthodox views, even among some of the scholarly mythicists. Uh, yeah, and this, it, this it, is it, what it, Ehrman it, took him to yeah. task for with regard with regard to like, for example. There are a number of Pauline epistles that just almost everybody says, "Yep, these were written by Paul." Then there's a few others that. Most scholars say weren't written by Paul. And then there's some that are in question, like Second Thessalonians. But here's the question, Eddie. You're God, okay? For, for the sake of this question, you're, you're God. Okay. Okay. And you've decided for some reason, we won't even go into the reason, that you are going to take a portion of yourself or a co-equal with yourself 
and come down and take human form and sacrifice yourself to yourself to serve as a loophole for rules that you have control over. And the evidence that you're going to leave for this is stories that cannot be verified from anonymous authors that are passed around verbally, that are changed and altered. Is that sufficient reason to believe that Jesus was divine, that he was raised from the dead, that he is the one and only way uh, to heaven, or that any of the things that Jesus is supposed to have said are actually true? But that's, that's not why I called in. I, I know, I'm asking... Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, doing, yeah, okay, are, Okay, what I'm okay then, the Eddie, mythicist, Eddie, mythicist, Eddie, 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 yeah. then I might as well hang up because I don't disagree with you about the mythicist position, so why are we wasting time on it? I'm at, I, I asked a question. I mean, is this sufficient to justify that belief? Uh, the way I have a, well, first off, just so you know, so we're coming from a level playing field, I don't really have a high view of Scripture. So if you're asking me to say, like, is the Bible the inherent word of God? And sure. Like, no. I, I'm, I don't have a high view of Scripture. Do I think... I, I'm probably more in the vein of a Dale Martin as far as my belief structure, where I think these guys had a spiritual experience. I think they conveyed it the best they can. I think I, I personally was an atheist who became a theist because I had some experiences. I'm a rational person. I cannot explain them. I have. Well, to hang on. Them. If you had experiences that you can't explain, then what made you become a theist? Because... Using theism as the explanation for something you can't explain, now you're, now you're contradicting yourself. No, I'm, I'm saying I'm a rational person. I, I had an experience, and, and, and I, it, there's, there's virility to it because there's other people that were in the room when I've had that experience. I, had, so I was with someone who killed himself. Okay. And from the point she killed herself on, um, yes, I'm sure there were... Things that I hallucinated, I have no doubt in my mind. But then there were other things, like, you know, things that moved, where people were there to witness it. Okay, what is, what is the myself. explanation for what you experienced? I have no idea. No then idea how, it, how could that possibly be relevant to changing you from an atheist to a theist? If you don't have an explanation, then shouldn't the answer be, I don't know? No, well, no, because I, when I read the Bible... Right, and and I read about these experiences that these people probably couldn't expand, explain for their time, and it probably, I that's my view of it. My view that's of like sure. saying that I don't know who killed him, but I read a book about the a butler doing it, so I'm going to go with the butler did it. No, no, everyone has these. Every, I think anyone who has a legit, legitimate, I don't know, we'll call it a metaphysical experience. How do you know whether it's legitimate? Like, like I said, a couple of things that I experienced, I had witnesses. Okay, I had like light bulbs. I had light bulbs like literally blow out. I've I've had light bulbs blow <laughs> out too. It didn't make me no, believe no, no. in a god. Not, I mean, I mean, blow out like at a point in a conversation when we were talking about the girl that killed herself. Okay, like, and I'm not okay. talking blow out. I'm not talking go out. I'm talking shatter. Okay, I'm talking blow up. And you had, you, and what is you, the explanation for that lightning bulb for that light bulb blowing up? That that's just one of many. I'm 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 talking about. That was just one of many, many things. It doesn't matter if it's one of a gazillion things. I'm asking about the one. Okay. Well, like I say, my rational mind, my scientific mind, would say, hey. Do you have another mind? Do you have some non-scientific, non-rational mind? Well, no, I, 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 think, I, I listen to yourself. And, yeah, I, I think you get the non-rational people that call in all the time, yes. Absolutely. Okay. I, I, I consider myself pretty rational. So do they. On the scientific side... So my scientific side would say, how do, how do you test for that? How do we repeat that experiment? Sure. You yeah. can't. Why yep. not? You can mention her name again um, around other light bulbs. Couldn't you? We, we could. Yeah, and then if the other light bulbs don't explode, then you just had a one-off coincidence. Right. Okay. And then Have you tried that? The, that was just, like I said, that was just one experience. Well, what, that's what, not the issue. Did that? you actually try oh, right. it? Just saying that you have other experiences. No. Okay, so then that one experience becomes irrelevant because you haven't bothered to test it. It can't be used as a bit of information included. Now let's go on to your next of a bunch of them. Okay, so what, what if the same thing happens? You mentioned her name and then it falls off the walls at that exact did you, did you Did you try to replicate that as well? 
No, because stuff okay, like that. Okay, so that one's dismissed like that for the same reason the first one was dismissed, right? Oh, okay, no, but that's why I don't dismiss them, because it was like, you have to understand the context. How, like, how are you relating it to what was being said as opposed to something like what was on television at the time or hey maybe maybe it was just a bunch of a bunch of coincidences but if it happens over and over and over again at some point I, I it opened my mind right but and what you're basically I'm, saying is that if I hadn't been talking about her the thing wouldn't have fallen off the wall and I'm wondering how you would know that I, well I, I, I will say this stuff like that didn't happen unless she was mentioned. I know when I moved out of the place, I know the people that moved in after me were having problems there. Okay, so let's say for just a second. Were they so, mentioning her name? No, but they had weird stuff that happened. But they, they, but they didn't, didn't happen. but they weren't talking Probably. about her. So so it's like, not prior, tied to mentioning okay. her name. Yeah, and here we go. It, I, had, I had a dog at the time. The dog would not go into the room that she killed herself in. The, that dog okay. was in that room all the time, but the day after she killed herself, that dog would never, ever go in that room. Cool. Why not? Go right. Why not? I have no idea. Okay. I have then, no idea. Then we'll put that on the pile of we don't know what the explanation is, right? Right. But, but so, so do you have anything that's not on that pile that you could use to convince, to be a convincing argument for why you believe? I, because because here's, here's saying, the problem. I'm open-minded. A, a, open you're too open-minded because well, actually, you're well, it's you're reaching not open-minded if you've concluded something without with, while you're admitting that you don't know the causes of these things. No, I'm concluding. No, I, I think I'm being open-minded because I'm saying prior to those experiences, I believe was an atheist, <laughs> and now you believe it, you're in theism. I, so you have right. concluded something here about so, the explanation. I, I concluded that I had too many experiences, and like I say, I'm just that a could not be had explained. Way. You had a whole bunch of experiences that you have no explanation for, and then you concluded and now that the explanation them, is theism. You just made up an explanation. Because here's the thing: let's say for a second that you're. We'll just go with the two examples that you that we talked about, where a light bulb went out when you mentioned your name, and something fell off a wall when not, you mentioned. Not went out. Not went out. Okay, a light bulb exploded and shattered and put yeah. glass into your head. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Let's say that you mentioned her name and a light bulb exploded, and you mentioned her name and something fell off the wall, and you've already acknowledged that you don't have an explanation for what those are. Is it possible that she was there in spirit form and there's also not a god? It, yeah, it could be. Okay, I, is, it like possible said, that, is it possible that she wasn't there in spirit form and something else was going on that you don't know? It could be. Then it how the hell do you like get from thing. atheism to theism with two more unknowns? I have a question, though. Or 20 no, more I, I've got a question. No. Is it possible that you talked about her more after she died in the house? Yeah, but you have, if, if you understood the context of those, those situations that I was talking about, it was like uh, one of them I had a friend over, and my friend was kind of talking bad about her when the light bulb blew up. And I even, I even reached out to her recently and said, hey, do you remember when this happened? Because this happened a while ago. Mm -hmm. And she said, yeah. And same thing. Um, I, I explained this, explain this one to me. I no, 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 no. I guess what this I want, but I'm wondering, like, let's suppose you had been talking about a recipe for carrot soup when the light bulb blew up. I mean, would you be superstitious about discussing recipes? Pro it probably wouldn't have even registered on the radar then. But right. So you it, were predisposed to connect these things, right? You're making a connection between two unconnected things. There's no, there but is no connection between your friend died in the house and light bulb malfunction. I mean, your your mind is making a connection, but that you're not actually showing a demonstration that connects these events. That's the problem here. Is that your mind is connecting it without that connecting part. I, but, but here's the thing. I wasn't talking about carrots when the light blew up. I was, Correct. You know, Correct. We were talking about but her. you said if you were but, talking about carrots, you wouldn't tie it to carrots. And I'm like, well, then why are you tying it to her? Because that's what I'm saying. I, when I take the pattern of all the different events, you are creating the pattern. Yeah. This is, I, I this think is you're why noticing I interjected. things. You're not you probably talked about her a lot more after she died in the house. I know I would. And you are connecting anything that occurs. I mean, there's probably other I mean, was there never a time when you talked about her and something weird didn't happen? 
Yeah, but okay, hey. let me throw this one. This is starting no, to look no, really no. random. I mean, the, no, the reason okay. I the okay. reason I interjected a second ago is because the words that came out of your mouth were, okay, then explain this to me. And that's significant because it shows that you are inappropriately positioning where the burden of proof is. Because what you're going to do is say, I have a story that I can't explain. Explain it to me. Because if you don't offer, no. because if you, if you can't explain it to me, then I'm justified in thinking that it was a ghost in God. That is a fallacy. It's a, it, but it's not, it's not just an experience. I, you're, it doesn't you're, matter like how many, Eddie, it doesn't matter how many of them there are. The, the plural of anecdote isn't data. Right. The, a whole bunch of unexplained things doesn't add up to one explained thing. Mm, you know, I, I got to challenge you on, on that, though. Well, okay, go, then challenge me, because my statement was a whole bunch of unexplained things does not amount to one explained thing. Please, please argue against that point. Okay, if you have a bunch of unexplained things, right, but they all seem to point back to one thing, like this person who killed himself. How do you know they point back to one thing? But it, it was either her being mentioned or the, the first time I went. It, the so first so time you're, you're saying you have a whole nope. bunch of you have a whole bunch of unexplained things that are correlated with something else. Yeah, the dog not going in the room. She yeah, correlation the isn't causation. I mean, that's a, the foundations of reason there to not make the mistake of thinking that because this and this happen together, that they're necessarily tied together. Just like well, I, it, I disagree. I disagree with that because well, then you are not a rational well, person. Yeah, I mean, I could say, say you are throwing you are throwing you are throwing logic and reason out the window. Every morning before okay. the sun comes up, my rooster crows. Every single morning. Does that mean that my rooster crowing causes the sun to rise? No, but but it happens okay. every morning. But we correlate data, and then we know the Higgs boson exists. Okay. We didn't we're know done. that. We're done. We're know. done, Eddie. We're done. What? Be we're, do we're done because what? at no point in this conversation, nothing about this conversation is relevant to the Higgs boson. You are just now no, no. spewing what? forth words that are irrelevant because when we challenge you, no. then argue right. against, you then argue against the point. You challenge me about correlating data. I correlate data for you and tell you this. Here, here, I give you the scientific example. No, you didn't. That, no, you didn't, Eddie. Did you say, said you said a light bulb data, exploded when we data. mentioned her name, and when Tracy no, 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 when no. Tracy asked you if you tried to replicate that, which would perhaps be close to scientific, you said no, you didn't. So don't pretend like you're presenting scientific data when you're not. No, but you, you just part, said you're you presenting an anecdote. Correlation of data, but you told me correlation of data doesn't prove causation. I just gave you an example where it does. No, you and didn't. Like, oh, this calls over. <laughs> <laughs> you don't understand the difference between I, correlation and causation. I, I'm sorry. Uh, the, I, the accumulation of data that shows a causal connection, that demonstrates a causal connection. By the way, science doesn't make proclamations about what's absolutely true. All it does is demonstrate models that are the best explanation of what we see and observe, and they are always subject to revision. Right. What they're saying is the best probable explanation for this set of data is this. But the, the thing is, though, you right. have to have that coupling, right? So it's like you've got to have a theory that explains how this and this actually could be causally connected, and that's what you're missing. You're, right, no, and that's what, I, no, that was my whole point. Like I say, I really did look through all these separate different events, and it was more than, it was more than a couple. It was many, many. Okay. And like I say, the only thing I could come up with where it kept coming back was this one what this one thing. Okay, so what is your stuff. theory for why mentioning a person's name would make a light bulb explode? I I can't explain it. All I like I say all Okay, I, that's the difference I, between what Matt was describing as far as collecting data. If you make a theory about a causal connection and you say I think this is causing this and I believe that it's causing it in this way, like you have the theory that explains how it's causing it. Then you go in and you start saying, well, if it was causing it this way, then if I do it under these conditions, it, should, it shouldn't work, right? All right. And you, so, you, so you start trying to falsify your data by trying to show that, that you're the coupling thing that you have built in your 
model to explain how A and B are connected will or won't work, and you should be able to test for that. What you're saying is, I've got the two things, and I think they're connected, but you're not explaining how you think they're connected. You're saying, we say her name, the light bulb explodes. I believe saying her name is causing the light bulb to explode. And what I'm saying is, what is the theory? Where is, where is your explanation for how that is causing it? Well, no, my, my, I have no other explanation. Than you, you don't have any explanation. Say, say, Eddie, 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 wait. Saying, I have no other explanation is already a logical but, fallacy. That is already a logical fallacy. That is the argument from ignorance or argument from incredulity that I can't come up with any better explanation. But it's worse than that because, as Tracy just pointed out, you don't have an explanation. Don't compare this no. to science or the Higgs yeah, there's boson. There's no theory here tying these events together. There's just you saying you believe they're tied together, but you're not, you don't even have a, an explanation for how one would even result in causing the other. Where's your Nobel Prize for but, uh, linking okay. falling pictures with a god? I didn't, I wasn't even going, I wasn't even going to take us on that job. I was taking us from the mythicist position as okay. untenable was where I was kind of going with that. And yeah. then I was just telling you why I became a theist and why I became open-minded to it. Yeah. Because I've had experiences that I cannot explain. And it's not just a light bulb. I mean, it was, it was Eddie? many, many, many. Eddie, if I have some yeah. experiences that I can't explain, and then I tell you that I accept an explanation, what would you call that? If, I, if you have a theory that you can't explain. No, if he has some... But I have a number of experiences that I acknowledge are unexplained. And then I tell you, but I've gone ahead and accepted an explanation. Am I rational? So you're putting... You can be, yeah, because we... You know, it's just... Okay. Is, is that I rational? Guess, is what? it rational to say I have several things for which I don't have an explanation, but because of them, I'm going to accept an explanation? Well, that does not feed into Godel's ontological argument. Okay. <sighs> I asked a question about not, whether or not, not something not would be rational. I asked a question about whether or not something would be rational. Eddie, let me finish. I asked a question about whether or oh, not something would be rational. And once again, you have thrown out something new and irrelevant. Okay, let me explain how it's relevant. The, the, with You're the, not going to explain how the ontological argument is relevant to pictures falling down and why you accepted that a number of things for which you don't have an explanation add up to an explanation. That not, has when nothing have, to do with the ontological argument. No, when you have things that come outside of a scope of something that, can, like I said, I'll give you a couple examples. There are a bunch of examples. I don't like want you to give me a couple of examples, Eddie. I'm tired of you derailing this. Just address the issue. Because every time we go to new examples, you just acknowledge, yep, I don't have an explanation for that. Yep, I don't have an explanation for that. But all that adds up in your own. No, I, no I, I, there, for those things that I don't have an explana a, 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 a rational explanation for is where it took me to that. It's the best thing it, I got wait, right a minute, wait a minute, theory. wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, Eddie, theory. Eddie, I didn't understand what you said because the phone broke up. You said for those things for which I don't have a rational explanation, what? Then I have to theorize. No. That's... No. That's what's not, that, no. That's actually a rational thing. <laughs> okay. For things that you don't have an explanation, what you do is you explore and investigate, and you build a model, and then you test that model. But we've already established that is not what you've done. What you've done is taken things that you don't have an explanation for and gone, mm, I can't think of anything better, therefore God. That's not science. That's not rational. If... It, you go with the best theory that you have. No, that, you don't. Is, no, you yeah, absolutely no. don't. That is how you get ripped off by con men and fooled by magicians. You don't just go. What you do is when you don't have an explanation, you say, I don't yet have an explanation. If you just go with the best thing you can think of, you are going to be conned over and over and over again for your entire life. And you don't get to identify as a rational individual. Well, I... I have to disagree. I, I know you myself. have to disagree because that's how you protect your irrational beliefs. I don't know if this would be <clears throat> useful or not, but in the idea about 
you know, I have a thing that I can't explain, and then I have another thing that I can't explain, and then I have another thing that I can't explain, and when I get to a certain number of things I can't explain, then I can just make up an explanation, or it becomes an explanation in some way. It's kind of like saying zero plus zero doesn't equal one, but zero plus zero plus zero plus zero, eventually it will get to one. But it doesn't get to one, because there's never, none of, the, if none of these things offer an explanation in and of themselves, Putting them all together in a pile of unexplained things doesn't equal an explanation. Just like there's no number of zeros that will eventually amount to one. No, but well, where that's that's a little bit different is if you're completely closed off to a metaphysical explanation, and then you have a bunch of scenarios. Eddie? We don't have a Eddie. metaphysical yeah. explanation, though. Is the problem? It's not an explanation. Not only do we not have a metaphysical explanation. Tracy and I aren't necessarily closed off to metaphysical explanations. Mm -hmm. What we're doing is saying, if you have an explanation, be it physical or metaphysical, you need to actually demonstrate that. You don't get to just say, I couldn't think of anything better, and this seems good enough. That's not the way well, reason works. No, but you're going to go where the, you're going to go where the evidence leads you, right? You don't have evidence. Like, okay. The, the evidence for your thing you've acknowledged leads you nowhere. Here's something I experienced. I don't have an explanation. That, by definition, is the evidence leading you nowhere yet. Right. And there's an assumption of causation, and even an assumption, there's an assumption that, that this person's name being mentioned is causing these events, but you have to go in and figure out how to demonstrate that that assumption is not just in your mind. Okay. What about, and, um, I'll give you another scenario. CNN, this is on CNN. I don't know if you saw it. You can Google it. There's a video out there where they went in and did a story on a, on a, a supposed haunted house. And the cameraman from CNN got attacked. Now, this is CNN. Okay, so I don't know uh, if you guys saw it. Yeah, are, you saying no, there, but, are you saying there aren't people who are rational who work for CNN? Because I don't think that's going to fly no, no. right now. No, but... They also have some other quotes from the house. Anyway, so that would be one of those things that I would put in that pile of things where I'm like, hmm, it opens my mind to that kind of stuff. This is someone else who had an experience similar to mine, that, and this was on TV. It just happens. I'm happen on, on TV. TV. Why don't you believe me? If you were attacked by a Top ghost, I, I would put oh, that so in that I, If I'm attacked by a ghost, you would believe me. But if I explain to you how reason actually works and how you ha can't possibly get to your conclusion, you're not going to believe me. Then that's good. No, I don't I, want you to believe me just because I said so, but I'd like you to actually right. learn something about how to reach reasonable conclusions. L hey, like I said, I, I consider myself a very reasonable man. I, I do. I just... I am just open-minded now. Isn't I know that, you consider yourself just, reasonable. How do you how do you determine whether or not somebody is actually acting reasonably? It, well, it depends on the situation. Sure. How, okay. So somebody thinks they're convinced that a, that ghosts are real, and what they tell you is, "I had some experience for which I don't have an explanation." Are they acting reasonable when they conclude that ghosts are real? When I, I think when I was sitting on your side of the desk, I probably would have said, no way. And Why does it matter which side of the desk you're on? Reason is reason, independent of who says it. It doesn't no, matter I think where when you have some. Well, I think when you have some of those experiences that, you know, I, I, could, I can honestly say, had I seen that CNN thing with the, the cameraman getting attacked, I, I don't think I would have given it even a moment. You know, I, I would have probably doubted it or something like that, but... But now I'm you don't doubt. So, so why have you abandoned no. doubt? It's not like I arbitrarily just abandoned, abandoned all forms of doubt. There's still a lot of well, stuff. Well, basically what you're saying is, basically, down. You. <laughs> basically what you're saying is, if I, I used to be an atheist, and once upon a time, if I'd have seen that report on CNN, I probably would have exercised some skepticism with regard to it. But now, because I've experienced things for which I don't have an explanation, I'm going to chuck skepticism out the window and accept that the CNN report was actually a recording of a ghost attacking a human being. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say I'm more open-minded to it, yeah. Where, where I, okay. Before I would have been completely cold. Eddie, like I think guys. we've gone beyond the point of wasted time because now you're just, well, I'm more open-minded to it. Well, I'm not closed-minded to it. What I want is actual evidence. But you said you used to be an atheist 
and now you're a theist, and the reason for that is something that you you can't you can't demonstrate is sufficient to justify it. If I say I, I, I have I evidence I, that the butler did it, and we should convict the butler, and what I present to you is stories of other cases where butlers did it, and you go, yeah, and I once knew a butler who did it, so I'm going to go with that because I don't have a better explanation for why Johnny's dead. Are you reasonable? Not in that scenario, no. Yeah, thanks. No, but... It's it, not different. I, we're, it would be reasonable. It, it's we're, not we're any different. Reasonable. No, well, it's it, a little bit... Where if you, I think if you were going to make it a more apples-to-apples -apples comparison, is if there was a string of, of butler attacks in a certain geographic area... How do, you, how do you know that they're butler attacks? See, this is the problem. It, you you I, think I, you well, are trying to claim that there's a string of ghost encounters, but you don't have any way to demonstrate that those are, in fact, ghost encounters. So you don't get to call them ghost encounters and then use them as evidence for your preferred ghost encounter. Okay, whatever we want to call it. Well, and that's where I go with the, the whole spirit. I mean, I hate saying, I know you hate the word spiritual. You know, I, I know you hate that because you think it's a loosely defined word. It I, is I, I loosely defined, and you're using it to cop out of actually offering an explanation and any evidence for what you believe. You know, it, like I say, you know, I would challenge you on this. Watch that. I wish you would challenge me on this, but you keep deflecting no, no, to I, ontological I arguments and Higgs boson. Uh, what's next? Leprechauns? Well, no, it, no, I, I don't know. I and a lot of the stuff when I look read books about particle physics and and you know even the ontological argument and even look at John Lennox. John Lennox is a theist and he's a mathematician. I I think you start seeing things a little different. In the order of things. I, I think you start seeing things a little different if you allow your skepticism to go by the wayside and your biases to take charge and the experts who are writing the things, who actually do the science, that you are casually reading on the side don't agree with your conclusion. No, John Lennox, John Lennox is a mathematician who's a theist. Okay, uh, I know lots of scientists who are theists. Francis Collins. I know lots Francis, of, I know, I talk about Francis, Francis Collins, Collins all the time. Does Francis Collins have any evidence or good reason for his belief? Do you know why Francis Collins is a theist? Do you know what convinced him? I read the, the language of God. Okay, what convinced him? The, well, what initially convinced him, the waterfall? Yeah. A waterfall right. was frozen into three columns, and that reminded him of the Trinity, so he hit his knees and he accepted God. What about that is rational? And what, is, what about that has anything to do with his expertise as a scientist? No, but I, I, I think that's the point. Like he said in the book, I think he just started viewing things differently. He yes, started, he know. viewed them irrationally. Well, you say irrational. I guess this is the, here's, here's where we hit at the water heads. You, you say irrational, and, and I would say it's just being open minded. And, and like I say, I will do this because I don't want to chew up all your time, but I Too would late. challenge you. I, I would love for you to watch that CNN. Just CNN I, I already have it uh, loaded. And you know what else? I, would I can probably just Google CNN ghost attack and find a bunch of people yeah. offering this. But here's the thing what if I watch it and I don't have any explanation for what was going on? What then? I would, well, and, and that's that's where we would differ a little bit because I would keep an open mind to it. No, 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 now, you're not answering. You're not answering the question. You are you are getting closer and closer to word salad. I asked a specific question. <laughs> if I watch okay, the I'm video sorry. and I don't have any explanation for what actually happened there, what conclusion can I reach? You're probably going to reach the conclusion that. You have no explanation for it. Okay. Which is what conclusion, what conclusion should I reach? It, it, dep it depends. Like I no, said, it, it doesn't, doesn't depend. Change. Reason doesn't change whether I'm using it or you're using it. What conclusion? <clears throat> Somebody watches that CNN video, and they don't have right. any explanation for what went on. What reasonable conclusion should they reach about that? It depends, probably, well... It, it, it doesn't I'm depend, really... Eddie. It doesn't depend. It doesn't depend on your frame of mind or your spirituality or your scope of, of what you might have read or whatever else. Based on the facts, if a person cannot explain something, then that is the conclusion. I have no explanation for this. If somebody else can explain it, then they can present that explanation and the reason behind it 
And as Tracy was pointing out, the methodology that links that to make it a reasonable explanation. And once you have that information, you might be reasonable, it might be reasonable to reach a conclusion. But if you say, I've watched that and I have no explanation for what that is, that's the conclusion, that's the point. You don't get to just add to it. I didn't want to drag the call on, so I didn't want to introduce something new, but it reminds me, it's almost like the opposite of calls or letters that we get from people who are like, I started to understand the illogic of my belief in God, and now I'm looking back at these things that I thought were like these spiritual experiences or these unexplained things, and I realize now that it's just unexplained things and that there's really no rational reason to assign an explanation to something if the, if the reality is I don't know what happened. This is people's discomfort with being able to say, I don't know. I'm just saying it's funny that we get the, the same letters and calls in reverse. Yeah. People that have said, I've had these experiences and I am still beginning to see why assigning God to it is irrational. Yeah. I had these experiences and for a number of reasons, I attributed them to God or the supernatural. Yeah. I, st I stood in church for many years and I would feel the euphoria that I would attribute to the Holy Spirit. Why? because that's what everybody else around me attributed it to. Yeah. And when you're in that mindset, when you're in that context, uh, it feels reasonable, it feels rational. It's not. It reminds me too, though, of a little book that I brought in. It was just a journal, but on the cover it said, pray until something happens. And it made me laugh, right? Like, I mean, the, the thing about it is it's a, it's a theistic statement. Yeah. Like they intend it to be a certain way, but when you read it as an atheist, it's really funny because it's almost like when my mother used to say she had the magic chant to turn the light green in, in traffic, and you just say the magic chant and just keep saying the magic chant till that light turns green, right? And it'll turn green. Something is going to happen eventually in your life. So, yeah, if you keep praying, something's going to happen. But I got news. If you don't pray at all, something's going to happen. So it's, uh, it's kind of a funny thing. There's a lot of the phrases like that that I take differently now. Like, um, God helps those who helps themselves. Yeah. I look at that completely differently now. It's such an atheistic statement. God picks up this envelope every time I pick it up. <laughs> look at that. Thanks, God. Well, and also, exactly if you want that me. envelope picked up, yeah. you'd better pick it up yourself because God, you know, if you're waiting for God to do it, uh, it's not ain't going to happen. So it's really interesting how these things kind of take on a different nuance. It is spooky. <laughs> I, I realize that there's a lot of coincidences that happen that are, that are spooky, and we draw these connections. We, yeah, we do. Oh, I said her name, and then the light blew up. Oh, and, and I loved it. You're, you're like, why didn't you try that again? Did you try that again? No. Go, to, go buy another, go get another light bulb or go stand by another light bulb. And, and I think one of the reasons that people don't necessarily try that again is fear. And not, ne not just fear of, oh my gosh, I'm going to say your name and another, I'm going to lose another light bulb and I'm out another $3 or, or $30 if it's one of those LED fancy ones. It's fear that they'll say your name and it won't happen. So now we're in that scenario, much like the experiments where uh, the chickens end up training themselves. Yeah. So random things will happen when they peck on the, the right. thing. And then they develop all sorts of rituals. Oh, if I scratch my right leg twice <laughs> and twist a little and then peck, I get the food. When that has absolutely nothing to do with it. We draw these connections because we're not all that much brighter than chickens when it comes to <laughs> things we can't explain. But, Bird brains. Uh, anyway, we got a theist, uh, Austin in Gatlinburg. Thanks for waiting. Hey, thanks, Matt. I'm a big fan of the show. I want to start out by saying congratulations on that Women's March thing. Oh, Everybody that turned out for that. I, I shouldn't get any congratulations uh, at all because well, I showed up and I even actually left good. early. But, <laughs> but uh, that was that was great. Yeah, I would like to I would like to talk to you today about um, some discoveries I made through my own meditation. I don't know whether to, to say theist or atheist. What would you call a Buddhist? It depends on whether or not they believe a God exists. Yeah, there's no specific God. So Is there, a, is there a non-specific God? Huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it, it has you listed as a theist. There's, there's, so do, do you believe that there's a God? No, I don't believe in any gods. I, w I wasn't sure how you'd categorize that because, you know, a lot of people... If you don't believe in any gods, you're an atheist. All right. Or, um, or a non-theist, if you prefer. or what, I don't really care. The label's largely important, but you... Oh, there's an ask, There's like a tilde here. It's like oh, tilde okay. theist. We're not sure. 
Uh, yes. Anyway, you said you discovered something while meditating. What's that like? I did. Um, and uh, but, uh, before I get all uh, a woo and out there on you, uh, I want to say that um, I would like to believe that this is based in science uh, and my understanding of it. The last caller would like to believe that he was being reasonable. <laughs> and so. Oh, let's hear it. Come go, on. Go for it. Go. Um, but uh, what, I, what I arrived at is something that I've called Ravanya. Um, and uh, I, uh, I know it's uh, new, so you wouldn't know anything about it. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a, a brief introduction to it here. Uh, with the dawn came light. The light flowed out like a flood, chasing away the night, and flowed into 20 seas. These seas are not separated by land as ours, but are as oil and water, one stacked upon, the other, one stacked upon another. Hey, Austin? And the bottom, Austin. Yes. So first of all, the phone's kind of crackling, so I'm having a hard time hearing you. It sounds like you're reading poetry. Uh, I'm I'm sorry. This is uh, this is what I've written down for uh, Ruvanya, which is the discovery that I made. What, what's the number? Uh, what's the name Ruvanya. of it again? Ruvanya. Ruvanya. Okay. Yes. It's okay. Uh, Sanskrit for the sounding. In, in, instead of instead of like uh, some really cool poetry, could you at least like tell us what it is that you're talking about beforehand? Yeah, that would be a lot simpler, actually. Um, yeah. um, uh, so it goes from the Big Bang uh, and uh, tries to uh, incorporate all of uh, the particle physics that, as I currently understand it and um, tries to get us to uh, the, the world as we see it. And the advantage that I'm seeing with it is uh, it's more united because you don't have to go from like uh, a biology to uh, physics. You don't have to separate uh, the world into fragments like that. And uh, I believe that if there ever was a unified field theory discovered, it would look a lot like this. Okay, so <sighs> I, I, I'm trying, I, I realize I probably was, I, I've been in a mood and so I was probably perhaps a little too curt with the last caller, and I'm, I'm doing what I can to, to make amends, but <laughs> you're a non-theist. Are you a particle physicist? Uh, I'm not, uh, in much the same way that, you know, uh, a lot of the guys on the show here have a working understanding of, uh, you know, physical principles and stuff. No, so um, what, I, what, what I'm understanding is that through your meditations, you have come yeah. up with something that what we'll call a model. Yes. Uh, that is your version of a theory of everything. Yes. Why are you calling the atheist experience with this information? It is as yet incomplete. Because what? Wait, I didn't catch the In, answer. Uh, it is as yet incomplete. Okay, and, uh, so, so you've got a model and you're not even done with it, but why would you call the atheist experience whether you were done with it or not? I'm not a particle physicist. Right. I'm not working on a grand unified theory. I don't know what this has to do with atheism or theism. I have, I have no way, I mean, and, and, I, and it'd be the first unified theory that I've heard expressed in poetry form. But I, I think a good thing, sometimes if you contact like local universities, um, and ask to talk to, you know, even, I guess, adjunct professors. Sometimes people will talk to you. I've written to um, people that are expert in certain fields if I have questions about potentially a book I'm reading or something. I read a book on um, Icelandic uh, history, and I had some questions about their laws, and I actually found a professor at a university who was in a, a Icelandic studies, and they responded to me and answered my questions. And so um, I would say that if what you're doing uh, you think impacts um, particle physics and has to do with unified theory, it might be a good idea to reach out to somebody that's involved in that field and just see what they think. All right. Well, I won't waste any more of your time. Uh, thank you for the information, and I'm a big fan of the show. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Austin. Yeah, it's like I, I, I get it. I understand the frustration of having I've got this idea, and sure. it's not quite worked out, and I really need somebody to talk sure. to. Sure. I'm not that guy. Yeah, I don't. I would be no help at all, no help whatsoever. I mean, if you want to talk like to me about like you know uh, magic stuff or some sort of philosophical argument or some uh, nuanced uh, Bible questions yeah, or whatever, you know, yeah, yeah. I, tomorrow I'm working on a video that that takes a look at uh, claimed contradictions in the Bible and the apologetics surrounding them. Uh, lo love to have those conversations. 
I don't know, squat about. Yeah. Any, I've, any I've had that happen. There's people sometimes that'll ask me about certain things and I'll, they'll be like, can I get your opinion on something? And I remember one instance where they wanted my opinion on economics and I was just sort of like, I guess. And they said, the selling. question. I said, you know, here's what I would think of it. And then they proceeded to start writing back with criticisms of my response. And I'm like, look, I'm not an economist. You wrote to me and asked, what was my opinion on a specific economic question? I've never claimed to know squat about economics. If you have questions about economics and you want to, you know, argue with somebody about economic theories, <laughs> go talk to an economist. It reminds me of the, how many times has somebody called in with, I can prove evolution wrong. And that's, <laughs> that's their call. Well, this would be the place to yeah. change the theories of science. Yeah, don't, right don't worry here about going to, to journals or <laughs> biologists or, you know, any, they, I've, I've, I've got this, the, the crippling uh, end to evolutionary theory right in the palm of my hand. And I'm calling a podcast. I'm going to call the public access TV <laughs> show in Austin. Where this, where this douchey dude just will just go, why did you call me? You know, it's not fun. But all right, we got uh, Jimmy in San Antonio. Thanks for waiting. Jimmy, are you there? Uh, hey, hey uh, what's up, Matt and Tracy? Hello. Hey. Um, I, I can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. All right. Um, I had, uh, I think I spoke to Tracy once before, and I had mentioned um, mystical experience, uh, the work that's being done at Johns Hopkins. Um, I don't know if you. I don't know if you're familiar with that, Matt. Well, I may or may not be. I mean, I've heard it referenced before, but you can continue talking with Tracy, <laughs> or talk with Matt. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, yeah, the Johns Hopkins. Uh, I, I think I said last time they were using intravenous psilocybin, but it was actually uh, psilocybin in a pill form. Okay. And um, their, you know, findings are saying that. Uh, that the, it triggers what they're calling a mystical experience, and they've published, you know, papers and the Scientific Journal of Psychopharmacology. So, I mean, it's stuff that they're taking pretty seriously. It's not, you know, this um, airy-fairy nonsense that... Well, so I mean, if it triggers something... Was, it triggers something that, that they're that, labeling a, a that, mystical experience. That they're experience. labeling a mystical yeah. experience? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what he's saying. Like how, how do they know it's a mystical all, experience, and what do they mean by mystical experience? Well, from what I've, you know, I mean, you can look into it yourself, but from what yeah, I've studied... It's a 10-year-old study. For, I, I've got it. I just pulled it up here. It's a 10-year-old press release from 2000. It's 2006, so it's almost 11 years old. Uh, Hopkins yeah, scientists... Yeah, they're, they're continuing to do work right now. Sure. Like, they, there's they work show, that's continuing. Hopkins scientists show hallucinogen in mushrooms create universal mystical. They even put they, it in quotes, it in, quotes. In, the, in the title, yeah. experience. In the press release. So what do they yeah. mean by mystical and what, what relevant is it? Um, in other words, they're relating it to, you know, the mystics throughout the ages who had similar altered states. And, and of course, I mean, um, you know, people oh, back what's, then what's an altered state? What's an altered state and how do we define it? I, I don't mean to just um, be a pedantic prick. The, the, sure. the language that we use surrounding these things matter because if, like, for example, yeah, uh, for example when, they, when they were talking about the God module in the brain, which I think yeah. may, may actually relate to this, um, that was a mm -hmm. label they put on it, but it's not. Right. It's, there's no, there's no demonstrable link to a god thing. It's just we are going to say this is the module in the brain that when we prod it and poke it uh, or send current through it, people have experiences that they describe as spiritual. But that doesn't yeah. do anything to demonstrate that and there's, there's actually a truth. spirit. <laughs> yeah. Or... And and all of these things, whether you're using you know probes in the brain or hallucinogens or whatever, now you're talking about a brain that it is in a chemically altered state. Why would you trust the information and experiences that come from uh, a damaged essentially brain, a, a brain that is not functioning correctly? Why would you value that information well, more than a brain that's working correctly? Um, well, oh, I should say normally. Like we but not correctly. Well, we all know somewhat what altered states. We know what a cappuccino is. We know what, you know, digestive problems. I, I mean, these are all subtle altered states, but I mean, uh, Hang we're on. talking about something very... Jimmy, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. You said we all know altered states. I'm not completely sure yeah, like that I do. Ones, I know that there like, are claims yeah, or, about or, altered or, states, but or, did you also say cappuccino? Yeah, like, you know, a, a caffeine rush or, um, you know, some uh, okay, wine. A few cups okay, of I, wine. I thought there was an altered state called a cappuccino, and I don't even know what a cappuccino oh, is because no, no. I'm not a coffee No, drinker. that's not what I meant. <laughs> I meant like a caffeine rush. Okay, so you, um, you, we, chemicals like caffeine affect the body. Got it. Yeah, yeah. So what does that what tell us? What they're talking about is, 
is a is a very particular altered state of consciousness that you know that they're they're labeling mystical experience and and they've defined it by certain characteristics that manifest. Well, I think the they're reaching the back text. to the idea that this is what has traditionally been called a mystical experience, and what they're saying is they can recreate this using these yes. drugs. Yeah. yeah, from from the work of William yeah. James and so forth. Yeah. Well, I mean. And and Roland, Roland Griffiths, uh, the guy who leads the study, uh, as well as a lot of people who who've had this type of experiences, they end up with a a view that I think is the alternative from atheism and theism, where they see religion as a byproduct of mystical experience, like all the you know the major figures in, in history, uh, like Muhammad and uh, Christ and so forth, uh, Gautama. Okay, so let, as, let me know, let me ask this. So. I don't necessarily have an issue with that, other than words like spiritual and myth, mythical, mystical, sorry, uh, are not yeah. very well defined. And so, mm -hmm. if they think, let, let's say... Well, they say, define them in the study. <laughs> okay. I'm sure they would. I mean, they are well defined. <laughs> uh, I guess what, I, I, mean, need, what had... I need to ask is this. Are we talking about experiences that people label as mystical, because they that's just the label they put on them, or... Are we trying to argue that there is something supernatural about it, or is it just all natural? No, no. I think what we're what they're trying to point out is, I mean, most people have not had this experience, you know, and so, I mean, they are trying to define it. It, it is an altered state. It has nothing to do with the supernatural. Okay. Um, it's something that there's. Yeah. So, so basically, you're calling in to talk about how Johns Hopkins has given drugs mm -hmm. to people, and they had strange experiences that they would call mystical. I wouldn't necessarily characterize it that way because they're they're concluding that it's something. Uh, what they're triggering the mystical experience. Uh, the reason why they kind of separate it from just getting high on drugs is because uh, it's uh, it would be otherwise natural uh, to human beings. So, like if you engage a discipline like meditation or or uh, asceticism, or uh, it's also speculated to occur in near death. Um, you would have a, a similar experience. Okay. And I mean, no, they, they, no, Jimmy. Here's here's what I'm asking. All of this is about something that is natural, right? Yes. Okay. I don't understand the point. I don't understand how, I mean, okay, there's potential coolness here. I think, if anything, it would kill off religious ideas about the supernatural as, hey, you know, we can mm -hmm. have these experiences through other or similar quality experiences through other ways. Uh, not that it would yeah. remotely support any religious thing, but at the end of the day, we're still just talking about, hey, people have been reporting experiences and labeling this way, and now we can induce them. Okay. Yeah. And so, I mean, a lot of, uh, I mean, a, a perspective that emerges from, from uh, these investigations into the mystical experience is what they're referring to as perennial philosophy. I think I mentioned it last time to Tracy. I don't know if she ever bothered looking into it, but um, like, you know, Aldous Huxley, Terence McKenna, uh, so on and so forth. Um, they, after these type of experiences, they had this view where they no longer saw religion as a, an argument whether God exists or not, but uh, but they saw these these very specific altered states as uh, uh, bringing religion as a byproduct. So you know that Gautama, um, when he had this experience, he would go on to found Buddhism, uh, Christ, so forth, but, and. I mean, the characteristics inside these experiences are, do relate to all the, you know, the literature in religion. Like, um, I know a lot of people joke about, you know, being one with everything, but, but the way they characterize it in the experience is that you have a literal impression of a unity inside a phenomenon in consciousness. Okay. You know, and... Why, why should I care about any of this, I guess, is what I'm asking. Well, um... Because, uh, I mean, I, I would think that it maybe it might change your perspective as well. Instead of seeing... Change it, it to it, what? This argument I already accept the natural world, and I accept that people have well, different experiences, which we can also induce... We can, to we a, can have a more perennious... To, a, like, a, per, a perennious perspective, like the individuals who... Like Roland Griffiths, I mean, I mean, his idea on religion now is not, you know, like... Um, you, a, you keep... A, a nonsense. You keep mentioning names... I, yeah. I prefer ideas. I don't give a rat's ass about a name. Well, perennial philosophy, the idea that um, uh, our religion is actually a byproduct of this uh, particular altered state. Okay, that, I know, don't care. I'm asking why I should care about this. My, well, issue, I, my, I, issue I is, to... my issue is this. Are the claims of a particular religion true or not? 
I, I, it might be interesting yeah. to say that some religions are. Do you think that you're going to go up to any individual who's religious and say, hey, mm -hmm. maybe religions are all a byproduct of, you know, mushrooms, uh, mushrooms and, and uh, meditation experiences that produce the same sorts of effects? What do you think that, what impacts is that going to have on them? Well, I, I prefer to talk, speak to atheists because most theists are kind of closed minded about it. <laughs> they will think you're the devil and even talking about it. Yeah, and, you know, I, I'm just wondering. Uh, contemporary churches don't even discuss it. Uh, of course even though not, it because the they have a that, relationship with the risen Christ. Is the, That's their perspective on it. So, you know, it's like when I talked with Ray Comfort, there's no way to convince him that God doesn't exist because God is as real to him as his wife. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. So, I, Well, I mean, I, they sort of, I mean, if this is, if this view is correct, then that means that all of contemporary, you know, Western religion today is, has lost touch with its roots. Wrong, wrong, Christ, wrong, wrong. That's a fallacy. Okay, the fact that we can, the fact that we can replicate similar types of experience doesn't show you that any other one is actually not true. It could be the case that Jehovah's Witnesses are the one true religion that have a tie to a God and they experience something that's spiritual. And even if everybody else's religion is a false byproduct of the sort of thinking and problems with a brain on hallucinogens or in a meditative state, that doesn't tell you anything at all about whether or not the Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong. So you can't say... Well, I'm I mentioned more in the vein of uh, Alan Watts, uh, the way he would speak about perennial philosophy, that uh, Christ was put on a pedestal, so he was the one appointed being to, to have such an experience, but no one else. So it squeezed the possibility out, whereas if you go to Eastern religions, where they practice uh, these uh, meditations in temples and so forth, um, they're actually attempting to engage this experience. They, you know, they have a relationship with it, whereas... Um, the, the Buddha wasn't placed on a pedestal. They realized that it's a potential in everyone, but in a pre-scientific way of speaking about it, they, you know, you have samadhi or you have nirvana. It, it was kind of the a only way this way is saying, relevant is if the experiences they have are leading them to a truth. Um, well, I mean, they, the uh, you could almost say that the samadhi is a synonymous term for mystical experience. I don't know what the um, hell that, that has is. to do with what I just said. Seriously, I mean. Well, I mean, you said leading them to a truth, so they are in, they are engaging some type of altered state. What good I is mean, a okay, be, Jimmy? What good is a mystical experience? Is it is it teaching us something that's true? Um, I well, in the, the 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 way they characterize it, I, I'm really not sure, but uh, I, I, it may be. I mean, the the one one core aspect of mystical experience is this felt sense of unity. You know that everything, be, everything in the cosmos, has one single unity. Okay, um, that's it's one. kind of like. Let me just. Can I yeah, help? Yeah, please, ladies please, for a please. What if everyone who went through this came to the conclusion that there are two suns in the sky, and they all declared that they could see two suns? I think what Matt is asking is, okay, so people do these things, they come to similar conclusions. We can induce this similar state in a lab. Does that mean that there's some ultimate truth there that they're seeing that we can confirm is actually accurate? that it maps to the world in some real way that um, anybody else's belief doesn't? Um, I mean, though, I, what I see is uh, seeing all, if you see all religion as a byproduct of mystical experience, and the underlying core of wh whatever they profess, uh, when you scratch all religions, you're going to find the insights gained from these types of experiences. And I pointed I mean, out that that's a fallacy. You cannot conclude that all religions are byproducts of mystical experiences. Have you, have you investigated all, by -pro all religions and confirmed well, that they uh, are? That, that, that is what perennial philosophy is. You it's, cannot I mean, test for that. What I'm wondering is, no, you would, you, would you accept that people can come to the same conclusions from different perspectives? Like that two people can, can, come, can look at different things and ultimately still derive the same information from it? And in this day and age, I think that's what happened. I, I think like all this, people like the, I just mentioned, like Aldous Huxley, Terrence McKenna, they, they did come to this conclusion, like once they had this experience. They right, but what I'm saw. saying is, is it possible that there are multiple ways to investigate something that would drive you to the same conclusion, that maybe you could do different experiments that were both valid but different and still derive the same uh, conclusions from them? 
Um, perhaps, I mean, the, the reason they use psilocybin... Is I think you could, but what, what I'm saying is, what if, what if these religions, these Western religions, come to these insights for a particular route, through a particular route, and these other people are coming to these same conclusions from another route? I mean, isn't it possible that two people, that, that it, one route doesn't invalidate the other route? Like, if I decide that, hey, we should love each other, and I come through. I find I come through my life experiences, which are completely different than someone else's, and they come to that same conclusion. Isn't it possible that we reach that conclusion both through valid means coming at it through an entirely different path? I, I think you could, I, but I mean, uh, one reason I think people do is because if the experience is universal. It's not. You don't have to be religious to have it. Uh, like I've. For instance, uh, if you, no, and that's you know, fine. That's what I'm saying. You can go another route, right? Like this person took mushrooms. This person read their Bible or something. Yeah, but they so came like, to I the mean, same uh, conclusion. And what I'm saying is, maybe the fact that someone got there through a mushroom doesn't invalidate the fact that someone else picked up a Bible and saw that passage and they related to it and adopted it for themselves through that method. Uh, you can probably come to it conceptually, uh, I, I think. But uh, a lot of the, the, I mean, the mystical experience is usually characterized by like intuition, like it's. I kind of shoves it in your face. And, um, like, for instance, like a, an, a, an atheist that might have this experience, he may not be inclined to call it God, but he sure. may say something equally absurd as, like, uh, I, I felt uh, I was somehow able to glimpse a higher dimension. And this was, you know, this is his, uh, what he could squeeze out of the experience. Are I mean, there higher dimensions? Dimension. Are... No, this, this is not necessarily to say. Okay, there then... It's just, this is... This is just the He's saying how somebody the, might describe it if they didn't believe in God. I care about what's actually real. Why are we talking about flights of fancy? Well, I mean, well, this is all just metaphor, but it's what, what's real is the experience, and it's very, you know, it is that I, I don't, a lot of people I'm, underestimate it. Jimmy, I'm desperate to find a reason to care, and, and I, I swear reading off the names on the books on your shelf it does nothing, and saying, hey, this is all just metaphor. It's just, I, I'm concerned about the real world and about claims and whether yeah. or not they're true. And I care about whether or not people's beliefs are rationally justified. I would, I'm still what? desperate to find anything in what you're talking I, what? about that is, that is relevant. Well, I think, I mean, it all points to the universal experience like that. Like all, all these so things. So do like you believe that, I don't know what you mean by universal experience and why, and when you say it all points to the universal experience, Please tell me what. Like in other words, you could you could potentially have this experience if if you partook. Like um, they. I don't spoke care about the, about the experience, Jimmy. I don't yeah. care who could have it. I want to know right. about whether or not what the experience points to is true. Right. I mean, because frankly, we could all sit in an electric chair and have the same experience. We could we could all be lobotomized and have the same right. experience, but that doesn't give us information on reality. Well, I mean, whether everything is truly a unity or not, I, I mean, I don't know if we can answer that and to know if whatever it's showing us is true, what, you know. What do you um, mean by everything being a unity? Uh, well, I mean, there's an uh, intuition inside the experience that everything is intimately in, in, interconnected in, in ways. I don't I give a rat's ass about understand. intuitions. I care well, about I, reality. I think from a physics standpoint, isn't everything already demonstrated to be connected, or at least When's the last yeah, solidly I, I think theorized? The, I mean, I, has I science started using intuition as a method now? <laughs> I don't know. I think mystics have used that. But, right, I mean, and I'm asking uh, why we should care about mystical intuitions. Are they leading us to truth? I, I, I think they're saying one and the same thing with what physicists are now discovering, you know? Um, you, you think mythicists' intuitions are saying the same thing of, as what physicists are now saying about what? Yeah, like uh, about everything being ultimately one. I think you're hung up on metaphor, because first of all, uh, what physicists mean, well, all right, go find a physicist who actually says everything is one. Uh, I, I don't know any that I'm aware of. They're probably out there. Find out if they mean the same thing as the intuitions. Because w now we've gotten to the point where some mystical intuitionist made this vague, everything is one, and now you're looking to see if you can find a way to make modern notions about the world that are based on evidence fit that. That is exactly the same thing that charlatans do when they make a vague prediction 
and then we call it prophecy. It's the same thing that happens when people go looking through uh, Nostradamus's text and saying, oh, if you read this this way, it's talking about JFK. It's the same thing that happens when you put the Bible code text together and go doing your circle word find and say, look, it predicted Trump. No, it didn't. The connection here is completely backward. The time to believe something is when there's actual evidence for it. These, these uh, intuitionists, there's no demonstration that they had advanced access to information just because you could take a metaphoric view of what they said and twist and turn it so that it matches up with something we now know is real. Because the only way we know it's real is from the science. Yeah, and Even if know, they were I mean, getting I'm... intuitions, they are completely useless until we verify them. So why should we care? And, and I, I wasn't directing your attention towards that. I, I, I think it offers uh, an alternative perspective to, to atheism and theism. Like, you no longer see God. How is this, this remotely? Inter- okay, the, first of all, there's no, there's no alternative perception with regard to theism or atheism. There either is a God or there's not, right? I, see, that's where I disagree. I, no, I think no, 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 no. Hang on, hang on. Either there is a God or there's not, right? The, those are the only two options. Is there some other option? Have you, have you managed to come up with a whole new type of logic? I think this is, that's what this is. I think that's what perennial philosophy is. It's so you're throwing out logic. You're throwing out identity, non-contradiction, and excluded middle. You are saying that there's something else other than A and not A. Uh, no, I, I think uh, when you have this perspective, it, A becomes something else. What no is up with the perspective callers today? I don't care about perspective. I care about reality. Either something well, is, thing either, either is, a statement is true or it's not true. Those are the only two options. Well, if you define God as like a... I don't entity. care about the definition, Jimmy. A statement, any statement, is either true or not true. Give me any other option other than true or not true. I, I mean, I, I just think it's seen, it's seen differently. Like, um, like uh, in other words, it doesn't completely reject the idea of God. It sees it as something else. Why are you as, talking about God? Those, I thought this was an I'm idea. Holding, <laughs> I'm holding a bottle in my hand. Is that statement true or not true? Oh, depending on whether you're holding it or not. Uh, oh, he, but he can't see. <laughs> oh, you can't see, so you're not, you're not watching. He is holding yeah, no, a bottle. Uh, you and I are having a conversation. Is that statement true or not true? Sure, it's true. Okay, is there any other option other than true or not true? I, I, don't, I don't think so. Well, you're right, there's not. I mean, that, this is what we understand about identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle. So either a God exists... Or uh, either some God exists or no God exists. Those are the only two options, right? Yeah, uh, under a certain parameter. Why I did think, it take... Yeah, no, so like, what, what do you mean under certain parameters? What like other parameters... God... Either so, some I mean, God... define God Jimmy, very differently. Jimmy, statement. Some God exists. That statement is either true or not true, correct? Sure, but I also adhere to agnosticism. There's with the no I, but... Where, you can't say sure, but the answer is yes. That statement is true or not true. But, but you're also using a vague word, like you're not defining it. I'm like, not, uh, it doesn't matter. It does, Fergal, burgle, minergal, burgle. That statement is true or not true? Um, if you're a pantheist, you think everything is God. So, you know, like to them, that's true. Jesus uh, it H. Can be Christ. True or not true. I just mumbled a nonsense phrase. Fergle, burgle, minergle, burgle. Yeah. That nonsense phrase is either true or not true, correct? Sure. And there's no other option? I suppose not. But I, I, okay. again, I think it's really based on definitions. No, it's not. Oh. This is so confusing. You, you acknowledge this, and then you say, oh, but it's based on definitions. You don't well, understand then, the fundamental foundations of so A or not uh, A. All right. Well, then, if you see it that way, then I suppose it's the not a, view. What other is, way can is, you uh, see it? What other way can you see it? Well, because, I mean, okay, an atheist defines God a specific no, way. No, this has and nothing then, to do with atheism or theism. This is about the structure of logic, a Venn diagram sure. with a single circle. And everything, 
everything is either inside that circle or not inside that circle, correct? Oh, okay. So, well, then to appease what you're saying, um, I, I, the per, this perspective of perennial philosophy, I suppose, can be considered atheist in that it doesn't uh, acknowledge uh, the entity and the, the supernatural entity. Please tell me two um, words in that last sentence that had anything the fuck to do with the Venn diagram I was talking about. A Venn diagram. Uh, well, I mean, I, I still don't understand your point. <laughs> I know. I give up. I mean, I... I I'm not talking the, about the God. Is, I'm talking about raw foundational logic. Here's a statement. The statement, no matter what it contains, no matter what the definitions are, the statement is either true or not true, and those are the only two options. Sure. Yeah, I, I agreed with that. Okay. So here's a statement. Some God exists. By your own agreement, that statement is either true or not true. Uh, sure. I'm, you know, I, it's either true or not true. I agree. Okay. So either there's a God or there's not. And there's no other option, right? I agree. You didn't five minutes ago, so I guess that's progress. Well, no, I, I, I've always agreed with that. I, I, it's just that I, in perennial philosophy, like words like God, Brahman, are no longer seen in, in, in the light that they were seen as, I guess, maybe an atheist or theist might look at it. Um, it's all, you know, it's, 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 that's why I, I consider it an alternative perspective, because, I mean, uh, in other words, Brahman is uh, the metaphor out of the mystical experience, like, or samadhi, or the beatific vision in, in Christianity, the agape, I if mean, I let you keep talking, I'm going to get fired, Jimmy. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and they can't even really, I mean, it, the board could say you're done, but... <sighs> doesn't matter whether you're talking about perennial philosophy, because that's true or not true. The Brahman notion of God, that's true or not true. It doesn't matter what it is. Everything is either true or not true. And I care about whether or not it's true. So telling me about mysticists who are having these intuitions that you can view as metaphor and manipulate them so that they seem to match something else somebody else found in reality, my answer is, so what? The reason those things are valuable is because somebody found them in reality, not because somebody intuited them. Yeah. They're of no value until we confirm them. And I think it's also a misunderstanding sometimes when, well, and it might not even be in this case, but a lot of times people do misunderstand when a study comes out like that and they use that you know, word in quotes, and they take it to mean a little bit, I think, take it to, I don't want to mean a little bit more, but they, uh, they give it a little more emphasis sometimes than I think it is intended to just say, hey, we can, I mean, putting people on anesthetic gives everybody pretty much, you know, the same experience. Um, putting people on all kinds of drugs will give them very similar experiences. It'll, it'll affect your brains in similar ways because we're all human beings with very similar brains. Yeah, it's, I, I, it's not that I'm not interested in a scientific study that shows no. that we could induce these things. Sure. It's what does it tell us? Right. And if your conclusion is, ah, oh, it tells us that religions are all this. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. So the one thing is that we're blocked from actually investigating and confirming the existence of the supernatural or its ability to interact. Right. Uh, we are almost out of time, but I've got, I got one, maybe two callers that are theists that I'd like to get to uh, that hopefully we can take fairly quickly. Uh, Carrie in Oklahoma, you had a question. Thanks for waiting. <laughs> Hi, hi. Um, I want to thank you for your show. I've been I've been questioning my faith for a couple of years now, and uh, was afraid of everything that I was taught about atheists. And you guys have broken through every bit of that, and I'm I'm so thankful. Oh, thanks. Um, it's because of you that I've made a lot of progress in a short amount of time. Um, but I do have a question. Um, I'm done with the Bible. I'm done with hell. I'm I'm done with Jesus being the Son of God. But but where I am right now, I, I'm I find I'm not just completely able to let go of the idea. I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional. Okay. That's okay. Um, of of God. Um, I I am hoping that there would be a God bigger and better than the one that's in the Bible, but. Um, like recently, we had this terrible ice storm, and my my sons are in college, and they were stuck in it, and, and it was scary for a while, but I felt compelled to pray. 
And then I thought, well, I, I might as well be praying to the Easter Bunny, you know. And that made me very sad. Like, well, I, why do you, why I, do you think it makes you sad? I mean, I, I, I know that you're, by the way, you are nowhere near alone. I mean, there's a ton of people <laughs> who, who feel this way and go through this. But what about it makes you sad? Well, I, I'm, I'm mad that I, I feel duped. I'm mad that I've been indoctrinated. I'm, I'm nearly 50, and I've been this way since I was 11, you know, but um, I feel a, a loss of relationship, yeah. if that makes sense. And uh, I, I guess if I, I'm wondering what I would replace that with, like this, or, or you know, if you can help me walk through it. Yeah, where I hey, there's, Carrie. There's hope on the other side. Yeah, <laughs> let me talk to you because I, I think I might be able to relate a little bit to what you're talking about. So you're, you, you've gone through a lifetime of a religion that basically told, taught you that you are nothing without that God. Am I wrong? No, you're, you're right. I was raised Southern Baptist. Yeah, um, okay. And I went to a... And so, (laughs) gotcha. (laughs) What you need to replace this with is you. All right. What they've done is spent an entire lifetime tearing you down to replace you with this God and tell you that the only thing that matters is pleasing this God and doing this God's will and your will doesn't matter and what you want doesn't matter and you're a horrible person if you place your wants or needs or desires or, you know, happiness above what this God would ask of you. So they've done everything they can to invalidate you and make you suppress yourself your entire life. And they've t- basically made you adopt this God as this other persona that is the only thing you live for. And now you feel like it's going away and you're like, I'm scared and I don't know, I don't know what to do next. And for me, that means you're going to have to spend a lot of time, forgive the phrase, soul searching, and you're going to have mm-hmm. to think about who you really are because they've spent a lot of years trying to make you not consider that and not think about it and not not and consider yourself important so what you need to do is think about who you are what makes you happy um and that's not it's almost like when you have you ever been in a long-term relationship like married or you said you had children i don't know if that meant you had ever been married yeah, I'm married. Okay, you're married now. Were you ever in a long-term relationship that ended? Yes, yes. Okay. When that ends, it's so there's like this period where you kind of get yourself back a little bit where you think, you know, I now I don't have to go and make breakfast or now I don't have to and and suddenly all these things that you did for the other person, you have for yourself. And I think that's, on the one hand, I can see how that would be scary, especially considering what indoctrination does to your head. But on the other hand, there's this really fantastic opportunity now to put yourself first and to think about your own life and your own needs and what you want to do and what would make you happy. And that's going to take some time. It's not like you're just going to wake up tomorrow and say, I know who I am and what would make me happy. And this may be really difficult for people who haven't been undergone an indoctrination or people who haven't been in a very controlling relationship for a very long time. But when you get out of that and you have to start thinking like, who am I? It's a, it can be a big it's a big job, but let me tell you, it's a wonderful job, right? It's a great job mm-hmm. to get to know yourself, and it's a great job to think about what makes Carrie happy. What would make Carrie feel at the end of her life like she had done the things that Carrie wanted to do, that Carrie felt was right, that Carrie um, was proud to be invested in? Those are the things that are going to replace it. And I, I apologize, we're completely out of time, but I want to throw a couple of quick notes on here. First of all, um, I I wholeheartedly agree with everything Tracy just said. Um, Don't beat yourself up too much. If you reflexively start to pray about something, (laughs) this has been your life. Uh, Uh And and the fact that you, you, you were frustrated because you're like, Oh, I could have might as well been praying to the Easter bunny means you get it. Uh, Don't, this is something that was, it was done to you that changed who you are. And now you're in a process of changing. Uh, You're, you're not alone, even in Oklahoma. Uh, I know because I've done atheist conventions and there are a number of great groups up there. Find some local groups if you can because there's a lot of people up there who are going through, through similar things and there's no reason that you have to go through it alone, although if you prefer to uh, and, and, and find that more comforting, that's, that's an option as well. There are also groups like Recovering from Religion. 
um, and, and many others that specifically tailor to people who are finding their way out of religion and are struggling with how to deal with it, especially those who are in positions where they feel alone. I'm the only atheist I know. I'm nobody in my family. I'm constantly you know, getting badgered. I'm not even out. I'm afraid to tell yeah. them. All of these things come up over and over and over again. Um, you, you are moving from who you were to who you're going to be. And the nice thing is you get to decide who that is. Yeah, it's an opportunity. And it's going to take some changing your head around and just work on that. Because just learn to, learn to trust yourself and ask yourself, um, you know, what kind of things you think are right. And think about why you think certain things are right or why you want to accomplish certain things. Like, just definitely don't be afraid to ask yourself. Because those religious tentacles, they go so deep. And ripping them out is not the easiest thing in the world. So, you know, there's things that I still do. Like, just a few years ago, something happened in my life, and it made me realize how still, you know, it overshadowed me still in certain areas that I didn't recognize. And it's just, you know, and I've been at it for a while. So I still catch myself singing the songs that we <laughs> sang on the church bus on the way to church. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I tr I've tried to replace them all with Schoolhouse Rock, which uh, is working. <laughs> But uh, that's the way it goes. I apologize. That's all we have time for. Uh, we'll be out. Uh, as a reminder for everybody else, you can go to uh, Star of India if you're here in Austin. The address is up on the screen here in just a moment. And uh, we'll be back next week. Don't forget about the Atheist Help and the Homeless events, the um, Ramp Austin Project. Ramp Project or, Texas Ramp, yeah. Texas Ramp Project. And February 10th is the uh, ACA's 20th anniversary party, and go fill out the survey. Tell us what you like about the show, what you don't, including maybe Matt should get less frustrated sometimes. I don't know. But thanks, Carrie. I appreciate it. And call us back another Thank time. You. We'll try to get to you earlier in the program. Thanks to everybody who tuned in and the folks that make the show happen. We'll see you next time. I'm Matt. This Thank is Tracy. You. Woo! This is Russell Glasser, host of The Atheist Experience. You know, The Atheist Experience is made possible by volunteers and the generous support of viewers like you. If the promotion of positive atheist culture and separation of church and state are values that you hold, please consider contributing by becoming an ACA member or visiting our product page at EvolveFish.com under the Partner tab. Thank you.